The next item of business is Members' Business Debate on Motion 19234 in the name of Maurice Corey on Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Maurice Corey to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted today to bring this business to the Chamber uh, and today. And I'd also thank members for their support uh, throughout uh, the Parliament for my motion. And particularly, I'd like to welcome Patricia Kepi from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, who's come here today uh, to listen to our debate. And I do appreciate all the work she does and plays throughout Scotland for, for the Commission. The work of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission certainly deserves our appreciation and support. As an intergovernmental charitable organization supported by six independent member states, the role of the Commission is to record and maintain war memorials and the graves of those who died in the First and Second World Wars from across the Commonwealth. We can trace back the inception of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission to the First World War. Sir Fabian Ware, a commander of a British Red Cross unit, saw the magnitude of loss felt through the war and recognized the important need to ensure that wherever possible, those soldiers who died were not lost, but laid to rest respectfully as they deserved. By 1917, this work under the title of the Imperial War Graves Commission was officially established by the Royal Charter and tasked with gathering and recording details of the war dead. By the end of the war in 1918, 587,000 graves had been identified with a further 559,000 individuals registered as having no grave. With war graves spread across all those areas which had experienced the catastrophic impact of war, many individuals were either buried in unidentified locations or where fighting had been at its most intense left unburied. It is therefore the, this, this depressing, depressing context in which the war graves, uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission set out to honour those who had paid the ultimate sacrifice. Through the sensitive process of excavation and reburials, the group could, could, been, could, been, could begin the meticulous process of recording and archiving the soldiers' details which we rely upon so much today. The Commission also allows the remembrance of those who died in war but were never found. The memorial to the missing provides a focal point for individuals who have no known grave to ensure that they are properly commemorated and are not forgotten. It is abundantly clear that the Commission workers take great care in tending to these memorial sites. This is evident through its horticultural care. The Commission rightly prides itself on employing horticultural experts across more than 150 countries, individuals who are incredibly mindful of being sensitive to the look and feel of these memorials and war graves. For instance, in Gurkha cemeteries, experts planted Nepalese seeds. In Dieppe, France, one can find Canadian maples to commemorate the fallen Canadian soldiers who have laid, been laid to rest there. And furthermore, the task of preserving and maintaining these peaceful places of remembrance falls to a group of over 900 gardeners which the Commission employs. The efforts of those individuals deserve to be commended, and I gladly do so here today. The Commonwealth War Graves Commission has recognized the impact of, of architectural design from the beginning. And in its uh, commemorative planning, it utilized a wealth of skills and experience by having three well-known principal architects, Sir Original Blomfield, Sir Edwin Luchin, and Sir Herbert Baker. Their work has culminated in making enduring memorials to the war dead, recognizable across the world, and for example, the Menin Gate Memorial of Ypres in Belgium and the India Gate, sites such as these point towards the enduring legacy of sacrifice visited by hundreds of thousands of people every year. And perhaps the two most recognizable and visible features of Commonwealth War Grave Cemeteries are the War Cross designed by Blomfield and the Stone of Remembrance designed by Luchins. Blomfield's War Cross was quickly adopted as a fixture of memorials and war graves across the Commonwealth as early as in 1917, with more than a thousand crosses had been erected in France and Belgium alone. The Stone of Remembrance is designed to represent all faiths and none, and stands as a symbol of common sacrifice. Poignantly, Rudyard Kipling, who was brought in by the Commission as a literary advisor, suggested the inscription on the stone taken by the, uh, from the Book of Ecclesiasticus, their name liveth forevermore. Of course, these architects could not carry out their work 
without a team of assistant architects, many of whom had first-hand experience of war. And surely their personal insights were reflected in the sense of the design befitting of those who died in service for their country. Equally, it is at the core of the Commonwealth Graves, War Graves Commission, and neither rank nor race matters. Every individual across the Commonwealth is commended and commemorated equally, without bias. And at its root, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission recognizes the importance of providing a focal point for remembrance and commemoration. And the monumental scale of loss through war, particularly evident in the aftermath of the First World War, left countless families bereaved and a grieving nation. And of course, for loved ones especially, a respectful memorial, one that encourages remembrance and pays tribute with great care, can bring the closure that they need. And today, the relevance of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission is in no doubt. Their future and their vision for the future is consistent with the ethos that has always underpinned its work to commemorate both service men and women fallen during the First and Second World Wars from across the Commonwealth. And it still seeks to endure, ensure that the archives and records are preserved safely. And by relying on an experienced and proficient team, war cemeteries and memorials are maintained with the utmost standard of care. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, the war Graves, uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission highlights an amazing depth of commitment and care. This is evident in the many, in, in the many soldiers who gave their lives for peace and in those who maintain their final resting places. And I'm sure that future generations will continue to be grateful for the work of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission in ensuring that their name liveth forevermore. Thank you. We move now to the open debate and speeches of four minutes, please. We have Bruce Crawford followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I come in by very much thanking Maurice Corrie for bringing this debate to the Chamber and also say how much I enjoyed his opening contribution and the knowledge he's just shared with us. As many members will know, this year marks the 103rd anniversary since the Imperial War Graves Commission was established, now of course called the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, a point made by Maurice Corrie. Established in 1917, its founding principles were each of the dead should be commemorated by name on a headstone or memorial, headstones and memorials should be permanent, headstones should be uniform, there should be no distinction made on account of military or civil rank, race or creed. These principles are as relevant today, President Officer, as ever they have been, powerfully declaring that each life lost is worth no more, no less than the next, no matter who. The role of the Commission today is in preserving the memory of 1.7 million people who died fighting in the horror of the two world wars of the last century. Understand where it's the case that the remains of a military person are found that are not from either of the world wars is of course the responsibility of the Minister of Defence to arrange for a military funeral. However, for a fallen person of the first and second world wars, it, it was and is the responsibility of the Commission. This responsibility is carried out with dedication and commitment at around 23,000 locations around the globe in 154 countries. President Officer, this highlights the significance of the role of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and how much of an undertaking the commemoration and memorialisation of our fallen soldiers is. In Scotland alone, there are around 1,275 Commonwealth War Graves sites. <coughs> These range from military cemeteries owned by the Commission, religious sites and those run by local authorities. And this includes 240 war graves in the Stirling area. An example being Ballangeich Cemetery, which sits in the shadow of the historically significant Church of the Holyrood, as well as Stirling Castle in the Stirling Old Town. It's also the final resting place of 58 people who fell during the two world wars. Stirling and of course Scotland suffered a tremendous loss of life during these wars. And I'm hugely grateful that the commission was created in order to ensure that there would be an official body tasked with commemorating the ultimate sacrifice made by so many. Of course, a major part of the role of the commission is maintaining these graves and memorials. All of us in this chamber take part in the annual commemorations for the war dead and my own constituency, the Scottish Government, helped to fund extensive reparation work on the Cenotaph in Stirling City Centre. It's another example of just how important commemorative sites such as these and the Commonwealth War Graves are 
to preserving the memory and lessons learned of the past. The First World War ended over a century ago, but now yet this annual ceremony to this day is a very, very sobering moment. A chance to reflect with others on the sacrifice made by so many that today's and future generations could live with the freedoms we often take for granted. President Officer, I'd like to conclude by going over some of the numbers worth again. They're worth repeating. 240 war graves in the Stirling area, over 1,275 commission sites across Scotland with 20,000 war graves. 1.7 million graves worldwide, of which 175,000 are Scots. Around the globe, at 23,000 sites in 154 separate countries. That, these figures on their own tell the scale of the, of the two world wars. The work of the War, the war Graves Commission is hugely important, not just in honouring the dead, but also highlighting the devastating cost of war. Generations throughout the last century had their lives torn apart by two world wars. President Officer, I hope none of our generations today or in future will ever know that horror again. Thank you, President Officer. Edward Mountain, followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First of all, I'd like to thank my colleague, Maurice Corrie, for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. As the years pass and the world wars become a more distant memory, it is important that the work of the war Commonwealth War Graves Commission continues so that we remember our war dead. Our war graves and memorials put into perspective the huge loss of life experienced in two world wars. And as Mr Crawford has said, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission honours 1.7 million men and women who died. And they are located at 23,000 locations in more than 150 countries and territories. Taken as a whole, I think the figure that I got from the website, that's the equivalent of managing 994 football pitches. Not a small undertaking. Presiding officer, when I was serving in the army in Egypt, I remember visiting the El Alamein war cemetery cared for by the commission. There are 11,872 Commonwealth soldiers buried there. And a simple search online will enable you to find all their details, country of origin, regiment, and family. Today, the way our war dead is interned does not glorify war, but is a respectful way of remembering those who gave their all. When I was there, I also visited the German War Memorial. Their War Graves Commission also does an equally good job. And it was an important moment of reflection for me. In peace, it is right that we remember that we don't want war and that it is every side that suffers. Now, presiding officer, I'd like to recount a brief story which happened when I was serving in Uganda in 1983 with a Commonwealth military training team. The then High Commissioner asked that if I was passing, whether I could visit a site which I think was called Simba Hill to view a graveyard that apparently was in poor repair. The request came from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission as apparently it was the resting place of one Ugandan soldier killed in World War I. Now this request wasn't without issue. Uh, to put it mildly, the area that we were asked to go to was an interesting area and one that I would normally have avoided. I still wonder today what the locals thought when it was going on when four heavily armed soldiers, clearly identifiable as Commonwealth soldiers, arrived asking directions to a Commonwealth war grave. It was clear that no one was going to offer to take us there and in most cases left in quite a rush, looking less than happy. When we did eventually find the site, it was an overgrown mess which given the eight years of Idi Amin's rule and the ongoing civil war was unsurprising. I reported back to the High Commissioner. Some months later, he, he sought me out and showed me some pictures of the site which had been completely transformed. I asked who had done that, and he simply answered, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. From that day on, I've had the greatest respect that they will take every care and, and uh, look after our war dead. And I'd like to also, important, also point out that it is not just that that they do. There is much more than tending cemeteries they do to ensure that the, two, the sacrifices of the two world wars are never forgotten. The Commission set up its own charitable foundation to engage with young people in the story of the two world wars. 
the Foundation supports educational initiatives, intern programmes and community activities, which not only help to honour the 1.7 million people that the Commonwealth War Graves Commission commemorates, but also equips our young people with new skills. Presiding officer, I'd like to close my speech by thanking the Commonwealth War Graves Commission for their tireless and dedicated care of war cemeteries and memorials across the world and across the Highlands and Islands. Now, on one occasion, I did contact them about a site at Arnesdale where the war grave was in less than perfect condition. It was quickly re uh, repaired, and I'm pleased to report that this work was taken out by the, undertaken by the Highland Council, who should have undertaken the work in the first place. But as a whole, I have nothing but praise for the Commission. The immaculate upkeep that they ensure truly honours the sacrifices, which so many of us, uh, uh, which have made for so many of us, and which the Commission's archives clearly demonstrate the costs of war. Thank you, President Officer. Annabelle Ewing, followed by Anna Sarwar. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I uh, too am pleased to have been called to speak in this member's debate uh, this afternoon, and I congratulate Maurice Corey on securing the debate, and I would also wish at the outset to welcome uh, Patricia Kepi of the Commonwealth War Games Foundation, who I believe I had the pleasure of meeting uh, when Patricia took the time to come to this Parliament last year to highlight the work, the important work of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. As we've heard, the Commonwealth uh, War Graves Commission is an intergovernmental organisation comprising six member states, and its principal function is indeed to mark and to record and to maintain the graves and places of commemoration of the Commonwealth War Dead of the First and the Second World Wars. The Commission is currently responsible, as we've heard, for the uh, continued commemoration of 1.7 million uh, deceased Commonwealth uh, uh, military personnel in some 154 countries. And as we've also heard, uh, uh, but I think indeed, as Mr. Cropper said, it is important to uh, really uh, uh, highlight the scale of the, the work in the remit of the, the Commonwealth War Games Commission, but the Commission is also responsible for the care of war dead at over 23,000 separate burial sites and the maintenance of more than 200 memorials worldwide. So indeed, the, the, the remit and the significant responsibilities that the uh, uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, is very clear to see. But aside from looking simply at the statistics involved, uh, I think it would be important also to uh, place emphasis on the fact that the War Graves Commission carries out its work uh, and discharges its responsibilities admirably, but it is also the very dignified way in which uh, the Commission discharges its functions that I think we need to uh, commend. And it's, indeed, there is a lot of care and a lot of pride in the work that the Commonwealth War Graves Commission do and a lot of sensitivity. Uh, and uh, as has been said, another very important point to, to make is that uh, all Commonwealth war dead are commemorated individually and equally, such that their name, if known, will appear on a headstone at an identified site of burial or in a memorial. And equally, uh, they are treated equally in the sense that uh, they are uh, treated exactly the same, irrespective of military rank, of their race or creed or any other uh, consideration. And these headstones and cemeteries and memorials are indeed perpetually maintained and carefully tended to. Uh, and I think it's also worth pointing out that the Commission itself has constructed or commissioned memorials uh, to commemorate the dead who have no known grave, the largest of these being at Tipval uh, Memorial uh, to the missing of the Somme in France. I would also like to make reference to the fact, uh, and I think it's important to, to mention as well, that uh, the Commission uh, maintained over 40,000 non-Commonwealth war graves, and it is also responsible Interestingly, for some 67,000 Commonwealth civilians who died as a result of uh, uh, enemy action during World War II. And this commemoration is achieved by the entering of the names of the civilian war dead in the Civilian War uh, Dead Roll of Honour, which is located at St George's Chapel in Westminster Abbey. Here in Scotland, presiding officer, as we have heard, there are some 20,000 war graves cared for by the Commission. In my constituency of Cowden Beath, there are, I understand, some 106 uh, Commonwealth War graves. These are to be found in Balingri, in Aberdar, in Cowden Beath, in Carden Den, in Inverkeithang, in Resyth, in Loch Ely, and in uh, Dalgetty Bay. And prompted by this debate this afternoon, presiding officer, my New Year's resolution would be to aim to visit each and every one of these 
in my constituency to pay my respects and perhaps the minister uh, would care to join me on, on one of my visits and I'm sure that such participation would be very much appreciated by my constituents of Cowdenbeath. In conclusion, presiding officer, I would wish to thank the Wargraves Commission for all that it does to ensure that the countless lives lost in World War I and World War II are not just commemorated, but are commemorated with the dignity that they so very much deserve. Thank you, presiding officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Anna Sauer. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I too start by congratulating Maurice Corey on bringing forward this uh, important debate and congratulate him, thank him on his unstinting commitment to this issue and to marking and recognising the role uh, of all our armed forces personnel, either current uh, or former. Uh, and like all the speakers, I want to congratulate the Commonwealth uh, War Graves Commission on their fantastic work, uh, all the volunteers and activists uh, involved in that work and their honouring of the 1.7 million men and women uh, who lost their lives in defence uh, of our country in both the First uh, and Second World Wars. I think it's really important, uh, particularly for uh, future generations, that we do recognise uh, the role of those that have uh, fallen, never forget them, and in the process, never forget both the uh, impact of war, but also the consequences of war uh, and uh, what it's meant for our history, but also uh, what it means for our uh, future. I, I particularly think it's important uh, are increasingly divided times uh, to remember the concept of uh, how we got here, the fact that we did have uh, Commonwealth citizens from right across the globe, people of all faiths and none standing shoulder to shoulder in both the First World War uh, and the Second World War, particularly when we have the narrative uh, of the far right uh, being established here uh, across the UK who want to demonise uh, migrants, want to demonise people from ethnic minority communities, want to demonise certain faiths forgetting that we are what we are as a country because of the sacrifice of people from various backgrounds, various ethnicities uh, and various faiths. Uh, and in the World War I and II itself, there were four million uh, Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus and other faiths from South Asia alone who fought in those two wars. Uh, 74,000 members of the British Indian Army lost their lives in defence of this country in World War I. Over 87,000 members of the British Indian Army lost their lives uh, in defence of this country in World War II. Uh, and that's why working in partnership with Colourful Heritage and others, uh, we are trying to establish the first ever uh, memorial to the British Indian Army and the con contribution they made uh, here in Scotland. And I know that is, from my discussions with the Minister, something that is supported in principle uh, by the Scottish Government and also by the Minister uh, himself. And I hope uh, that we can make that reality, uh, if not this year, then next year. Um, one of the uh, things that was done uh, recently is we had uh, the first ever memorial uh, to the British Indian Army that was held uh, at the war graves in Kunusi. And I know that was the first one last year, but this year uh, it was visited by uh, the minister. I know that was greatly appreciated by people, not just uh, who have uh, some heritage and history with the armed forces, but also by our wider communities uh, in Scotland. And I want to share just one uh, story that I think answers, as I say, that uh, call from the far right. And that is... Uh, these war graves, while they've only recently been discovered uh, in Kinusi, uh, while they've only recently been had their multi-faith, multi-ethnicity memorial uh, in Kinusi, bringing together charities, bringing together the British Armed Forces and indeed the Scottish Government and other representatives, um, there is one uh, woman in particular who I want to thank, and that is Isabel Harley, uh, who is a local in Kinusi, age 95, uh, whose own brother served uh, in the Royal Air Force uh, as part of the Force K-6 uh, soldiers and for the last over 60 years has been personally tending to those graves and looking after them, uh, showing the fantastic recognition um, that people of all faiths and none have in terms of the role played by all those people in defence in this country in World War I and II. And I hope uh, in the coming months, uh, working with Colourful Heritage, who want to capture, who want to celebrate and who want to inspire uh, future generations, uh, working with Colourful Heritage, working with the British Armed Forces and indeed working with the, the Minister directly and also with the Scottish Government, that we can have that lasting memorial to the British Indian Army uh, here in Scotland. And I just want to end by again congratulating Maurice Corrie on bringing forward this debate to again thank the British uh, Commonwealth War Graves Commission for their tremendous work and I look forward to working with them in the coming months uh, on these objectives. Thank you. I now call Graham Day to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister.
Uh, President Officer, uh, let me begin by very much thanking Maurice Corey for securing this opportunity to highlight the excellent work of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and also welcome the contribution of members because it is entirely fitting that this Parliament marks the efforts of the Commission. Its role as the custodian of the final resting places of the 1.7 million men and women, military and civilian, from across the Commonwealth who died during or as a result of the First and Second World Wars should not be overlooked. Scotland saw the death of around 150,000 and then 50,000 of its young men and women in the First and Second World Wars, respectively. Their graves are scattered across the, the globe, as we've heard, tended dutifully by the staff of the CWGC. Some, might I add, in places still touched by the horrors of modern conflicts. Of the 1.7 million individuals that I noted, just over 21,000 are buried here in Scotland across 1,300 cemeteries, many, as we've heard, from other corners of the Commonwealth. In my own county of Angus, there are 400 graves which the Commission maintains in 33 different sites, largely honouring young men of the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force who gave their lives during conflict. I think this, along with the contributions of members today, illustrates that barely a household in Scotland has been left untouched to some degree by the horrors of these wars and that as a result of the work of the Commonwealth War Games Commission, it, it, there's a reach into each and every one of our communities. The Commission's founding principles seek to ensure, as we've heard, that all those who made the ultimate sacrifice are honoured equally, regardless of rank, religion or race. To that, we might add, uh, on the back of Edward Mountain's contribution, also regardless of wherever they were laid to rest. Their efforts in maintaining and caring for the tranquil surroundings which form their many cemeteries and memorials mean that the descendants uh, can still, despite the many years that have passed, pay their respect to loved ones lost during those conflicts. That's something that I, as Minister for Veterans, am very grateful for, and I would be pleased to join Annabel Ewing on one of the visits she has pledged to undertake in her constituency. The other point I want to make today, President Officer, is around the extent to which the Commission really does represent the Commonwealth and the strong bonds which exist between Scotland and fellow Commonwealth members. Its membership includes Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and India, countries which Scotland retains very firm ties to. During Anzac Day last year, my ministerial colleague Ben McPherson, for example, spoke at a service to remember two young New Zealand pilots whose plane crashed during the Second World War whilst training not far from Edinburgh. And last October, as Anis Sarwar noted, I was incredibly honoured to be invited to speak at a commemoration service in Kinyusi that honoured the men of Force K-6 of the British Indian Army, several of whom are buried there. President officer, at the outbreak of the Second World War, these young men found themselves leaving their homeland to travel first to France before coming to the Highlands following their evacuation from Dunkirk. The young man whose grave I laid a wreath at in Kinyusi was just 18 when he left India. One can only imagine the impact those experiences must have had on him. The headstones there now mark the final resting place of 13 members of Force K6 across the north of Scotland. And despite the sad circumstances in which these bonds were formed, it's welcome to see that the links between our two countries still endure. To give it a couple of brief examples, the Scottish Government has provided support to establish the Social Enterprise Academy in India to provide support for Indian social enterprises, while 16 of our 19 higher education institutions have research links with India, including in areas of national importance to India, such as smart cities, health and water treatment. And I hope that these links will continue to grow and strengthen as the years go by, because I was so touched by the turnout at Kinyusi of so many different denominations of Indian heritage there, as I was, to honour the sacrifice made by soldiers from the subcontinent uh, and, in so doing, provide a sharp reminder to those who seek to sow the seeds of division of the kind of inclusive and multi multicultural Scotland we are and must continue to be. I could not agree more with Anna Sawar on that and also on his desire to see Colourful Heritage's wonderful campaign to provide a lasting memorial to the um, sacrifices in the Indian Army uh, realised in the not too distant future. And I have committed to meeting with Colourful Heritage in Glasgow to learn more of the work that they are undertaking. Presiding officer, war grave settings can be sad places, 
but they also serve a purpose beyond merely providing a fitting resting place and somewhere for families to connect with members lost in long past conflicts. Edward Mountain talked of visiting the cemeteries of El Alamein. Many years ago in a different life, I visited the cemeteries at Arnhem in Holland. It was an incredibly moving experience, one that left a lasting impression in terms of the horrific price paid in war and the need to prioritize avoiding such conflicts. A lesson today, more than ever, as Bruce Crawford suggested, we should be mindful of. So let me again thank Maurice Corey for bringing forward this debate and allowing us to mark the work of the Commonwealth Graves, uh, War Graves Commission. Thank members for their contributions. Uh, uh, Presiding Officer. That concludes the debate and this meeting is suspended until two o'clock.